This conference will now be recorded. All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us here tonight as we uh, introduce the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and Dr. our head of the div division, Dr. Gosain. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to him so he can talk to him about the department uh, for you. Thank you. Here you go, Dr. Gosain. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, those of you who are able to do so. I wanted to give a brief overview of plastic and reconstructive surgery in our for pediatric applications. As most of you know, it only for adult applications, but we deal with the spectrum of abnormalities shown there, breast abnormalities, including um, gynecomastia or, or overgrowth in males, overgrowth in females, or macromastia, um, and any other abnormal breast development in the female. And that's gone on to the transgender um, and gender reaffirmation surgery that we spoke about this morning. Um, burn chest wall deformities like pectus excavatum. Cleft lip and palate is an example of one of our multidisciplinary team clinics where we work with ENT, uh, orthodontics, dentistry, speech therapy, and a number of disciplines to get the best long-term outcomes for children with cleft care. Uh, vascular malformation shown at the last is another of our multidisciplinary clinics where we work with um, a number of disciplines, including uh, dermatology, genetics, uh, rehabilitation medicine for vascular malformations. Uh, the uh, Something we might not be aware of is cosmetic surgery in adolescence is something that we offer, um, particularly as people get towards the latter part of their teen years, such as rhinoplasty. Ear deformities we heard more about earlier with Dr. Yamada with microtia. I'm going to speak about facial paralysis. There are numerous defects at birth, and these can be diagnosed in utero, and we can actually see the families even before the birth of a child with a cleft or craniofacial deformity. And we uh, then go on to treat head shape anomalies, both for positional with helmet treatments, as well as for fusions with craniosynostosis. Um, a lot of the syndromic disorders have deformities of the jaw with difficulties in occlusion, and we deal with that as long as, as well as those syndromic disorders themselves, Apert, Cruzon, uh, Treacher Collins, those types of syndromes. Torticollis that's refractory to physical therapy, we can assist with that as well. So there's a number of things we do as pediatric plastic surgeons, and I'm going to go into one aspect of that tonight, which is facial uh, reanimation for facial paralysis. So I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to uh, just go through some of the problems that facial paralysis presents to us. The uh, starting with improve the innervation of the free muscle transfer. When we have facial paralysis and it's long standing, then we have to bring in new muscles because the old the muscles that normally animate the face and particularly for smiling are no longer available to us. They've atrophied. So we look at ways to bring in free muscle. And the most common donor muscle that we use is the gracilis muscle from the medial thigh with the most common um, uh, donor nerves being coming from the other side of the face as a nerve graft, which we call cross facial. Or if we do as a nerve transfer, we use the, the chewing nerve on the same side or ipsilateral side, and that's called the nerve to the masseter. The uh, cross facial graft, the advantage of that in coming from the normal side that has not been injured is that we have better spontaneity um, because when we smile, we don't smile on one side or the other, we smile on both sides. The difficulty is that because it's coming across a nerve graft, it's a weaker innervation uh, as opposed to a, a transfer of a nerve, which can be stronger because we don't come across that intermediate graft. So here's an example of the cross face nerve graft harvesting the sural nerve from the leg, um, uh, hooking it to the major buccal branches from the face uh, as shown in the diagram and taking that um, buccal branch across the face to the other side where we're going to let that, uh, that nerve graft grow until we can now hook a new muscle into it, which will be the gracilis muscle transfer. And so this is an example of a cross face nerve graft. We were, we're dissecting, if you see the um, the ear, the parotid gland here, we come in front of the parotid gland, find the branches of the facial nerve, take those branches of the facial nerve and hook them to the sural nerve cables that we had mentioned, this being the buccal branch, and we're going to take that across the face to create a cross-face nerve graft. 
And here is a girl who's had that. Here was her smiling picture before the nerve graft. Here she is. She's had the, she was paralyzed completely on the right side. Now we have done the cross face nerve graft from her left to right. We've now innervated the, the gracilis muscle, and you can see that it gives her much better symmetry. Notice it's not a very strong smile, and that's the mo major difficulty about a cross face nerve graft because we're getting the, the nerve fibers to come all the way across the face, and we tend to lose axons as that happens. Um, the nerve to the masseter, which is on the same side, is not a graft, but rather a transfer. It has a much stronger reinnervation for that reason, but the problem is the spontaneity is not natural. We have to retrain the children to smile. So looking at the nerve to the masseter, here is the ear, here is the um, zygomatic arch and cheekbones, and the nerve to the masseter comes out. It, it's an intramuscular nerve between the heads of the masseter muscle. We can then harvest that nerve, and then we can hook it to a um, to our nerve to the free muscle transfer. So there's no nerve graft involved. We take the free muscle transfer, hook the nerve directly, so we don't lose that power in reinnervation. So here's a diagram of this. We have the um, we have the muscle transfer here, which is the gracilis coming from the corner of the mouth up to the arch, um, a zygomatic arch. We have the blood vessels being hooked up here, and we have the nerve being hooked up to the nerve to the masseter. And so just giving an example of a boy. Give me a big smile. Smile as much as you can. There you go. Show me your teeth, Jonah. Yeah, good job. So that was him beforehand. Notice a fairly dense right facial paralysis. We're going to see him after the transfer. Okay, now I want you to smile with your teeth closed. Bite down. Yeah, do that again. Yeah, big smile. Yeah, that's great, Jonah. Perfect, perfect. All right. So you can see that we have um, used that. This is all nerve to the, this is nerve to the masseter innervating the gracilis muscle and taking that paralyzed piece and allowing it to move. The What we now need to train him is to do that with spontaneity and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So if you look at him, here was his best smiling picture beforehand. Here's he, here he is afterwards, and he still is in training to, to refine that so he can do it more spontaneously. These children often have um, eyelid paralysis, and we put a, a weight in his eye so that it, it's not he to minimize the dry eye problem. So then going to the next question, if we do do a nerve to the masseter, do the children ever adapt to that? And that's what we call cortical plasticity or automatically smiling without having to think that we're biting or chewing. And we, I'm just going to show a patient who had bilateral mobia, so both sides were affected. And we did a, grease, a free gracilis on, at age 12 to the right side, one to the left side at age 13, worked on the facial reanimation biofeedback and looking at the child at age 16. Here's the child beforehand. You can see here's repose and here's smile. There's not a lot of difference. Now I'm going to show you the pre-image here. Okay. Yeah, this somehow, this is not showing, but it show, it'll just show that there's no motion there. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get the, see if the, yeah, these are not playing, but they would just show the fact that we now are able to reestablish motion. For some reason, the video component is not playing. So that um, this is, this is the child after the bilateral transfer. You can see we have been able to retrain her because she's not biting and she's getting smiling on both sides. And here she's biting and she's not smiling. So that suggests that the brain does readjust and we call that cortical plasticity. The, um, so the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is the ability to bring the lips together or bilabial articulation and um, how can we improve that given a paralyzed face? So there's oftentimes poor lip closure on certain speech sounds that are, uh, that are there. We, when we try to speak and we look different, it can be much more difficult to understand. So here is a girl who has had, um, who has a right-sided, or excuse me, a left-sided Mobius syndrome. We have re her with a nerve to the masseter and the free muscle transfer. So you can see 
going from there to there, how, how much stronger her smile is. Then by now following her on from age 10 to age 21, um, she now, because she doesn't have the strength in the, in the um, sphincteric muscles, she can't purse her lips. So when she tries to um, speak, it's a long face appearance. You can see here because she can't bring her lips together. So one solution that we have is to treat her like a long face syndrome and actually try to bring that, uh, that length of the face down. And so uh, she's having difficulty with her bilabial sounds. We then, um, and she, you can see the lip strain in trying to close. So by doing that Lafort one impaction of the bones above that, we, we change her from the long face appearance to actually a more aesthetically pleasing appearance and her ability to close her mouth no longer requires lip strain. And so here she is at age 29 uh, or she, seven years after that Lafort impaction, you can see how naturally she's now able to close her mouth in a very natural facial profile. Um, and then I, again, I don't know. Okay, now we're rolling. Well, I'm introducing Anne Eversfield, who is now 22 years after um, facial reanimation surgery to the left face in order to use the pregracillus muscle transfer and nerve to the masseter for smiling. She's also now seven years after a Lafort one osteotomy to improve um, her lip closure and uh, bilabial speech sounds. So Anne, can you talk about how you how it felt to speak prior to the um, jaw surgery? Uh, prior to the jaw surgery, I would say that um, I could speak relatively, um, I don't know, not coherently, but I think people could uh, understand me and I felt comfortable, but um, with the lip closure, I think that's where I struggled and in terms of the P, B, and M sounds um, and possibly would try to casually, uh, you know, ma manipulate my face and uh, sort of touching my mouth. Uh, and uh, in any case, I would have to smile to sort of allow my lips to close. Um, and since the jaw surgery, how have you found, are, are certain sounds easier to make and do you have to make such a conscious effort to make them? Yeah, I definitely don't have to think about uh, the sounds I mentioned in terms of uh, putting my lips together and just I said before to Dr. Kosin at rest, um, my lips closed, which before they did not, uh, which is really helpful and they don't dry out as much and yeah, it's just a lot more comfortable and less to think about. <laughs> Good. Well, now I'm going to ask you, Anne, could you smile like you naturally do? Very good. Now, smile is wide, um, a wide, a wide smile. Can you do that? Okay, that's and do it with your mouth closed. A wide smile with your mouth closed. Okay, and now a, a wide smile with your mouth open. Okay, Th that's very good. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for helping us, and that's all we need for today. Okay. So that just shows a, a, a dynamic picture of children with these facial paralyses, and so it's a. It's complex because remember there's several muscles in the face and we're only re or re reanimating certain ones, but we have to be judicious in that. You saw how difficult it was for her to lift her lower lip and that's why she had difficulty with bilabial sounds and thereby um, making the face less long helps with that. Uh, the next question we want to talk about is recapture of the muscles. What if we have a central injury and we have not lost the muscles? Can we recapture those? So here's a boy who has facial paralysis after resection of an intracranial tumor, you can see as left-sided paralysis. Um, then as we, as we then are going to do a transfer, we're taking the seventh nerve, um, which, is the, uh, which is the facial nerve, and we're going to hook it to the 12th nerve um, or the hypoglossal nerve and do it as an end to side transfer. And so that will just give us that facial nerve trunk allow us to get at least nerve fibers into it to try to keep those muscles alive during the year that it might otherwise become paralyzed. So here he is, we've done the, the nerve transfer of, of seven to 12, and we've done a cross facial nerve graft from the left side to the right side. And you can see now, um, there he is at that point. We're now going to do the free gracilis muscle transfer um, 
and now we're going to uh, we're going to give him even more strength on that paralyzed or left side and there he is after the surgical therapy and so so you can see that going from uh, that smile beforehand on the left side to that smile afterwards is from that free muscle transfer and this is again cross based nerve graft another girl who had an acoustic neuroma again she's not lost the muscles on the left side of the face they're just very weak is there anything we can do to keep her from losing those so we again did a um a transfer of five to seven or the nerve to the masseter to the seventh nerve on that side without the need for a nerve graft and here she is 10 weeks out this is before we did that transfer and here she is after we've done the transfer. We've not done any free muscle transfer. We've just re-innervated the muscles she has with other nerves being the, being the fifth nerve rather than the seventh nerve. So the last thing I want to address is just the fact how important facial rehabilitation is in these children, that if we're doing something that's not the anatomic nerve, we have to reteach them of how to use their, uh, their thought processes for smiling. And we work with speech therapy. We have a whole team of the cognitive therapy group through our speech therapists. And we have to give them credit for really helping to retrain these individuals to try to get both symmetry of smile and spontaneity of smile. Um, and so those are the things that we work on. So in summary, we've covered innervation of the free muscle transfer, cortical plasticity to make that more natural, improving bilabial articulation, recapture of muscles after a central injury and facial rehabilitation. So thank you for your attention on that. I can stop sharing my screen and let's see if we have any questions. We sure do, we sure do. Um, I'm getting two of those right now for you. First one is, what is the preferred age to treat the perilous, perilous Sorry, I'm uh, the right case, now. yes. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. we, we prefer waiting if it's not a central injury. If it's a central injury, we'll do it as soon as possible because we don't want to lose the muscles. If we wait more than three months, we're going to start losing the motor end plates and our ability to recapture those muscles is diminished. Um, however, if it's if we the muscles are gone, like they're born without the muscles in a Mobius syndrome, then we wait till they're about four years old. And the reason we do that is so that the that the blood vessels and nerves are larger and increases our success of the transfer. Okay. Does the uh, perilous worsen as the kids get older? No, the, it stays. It, it will only worsen if we uh, it, if they've had a central injury and we watch them and we start losing the native muscles. In that case, we will the the muscles will get weaker. Our ability to recapture them is worse. But if it's a if it's a congenital paralysis, they're born with paralysis. With Mobius is one such syndrome. In that case, we do not the paralysis doesn't worsen. So we can do it at any age. We like to do it in children because their ability to retrain and that cortical plasticity is much better in children than it is in adults. So the ideal age, if I had a child with Mobius syndrome, would be around age nine or so because we can have good sized vessels and nerves and still have the cortical plasticity. Mm -hmm. And how many years do you uh, follow your patients? Well, for example, you saw the one patient that we followed her for 30 years. So we follow them as long as they will continue to be accessible to us. That's, that's amazing. And uh, there must be intense the speech therapy rehab. Yes, that's why it's so important for a facial reanimation team to work with our rehabilitation unit. And uh, to give credit, Holly McAmer is this is the therapist through the speech therapy group who's really been devoted to this, Laura Hinkes Molinaro as well, and I credit them with helping us to get the best outcomes. Well, that's wonderful. And and I and I just want to thank you on behalf of the physician services team. Thank you and Dr. Gengu Padai and Dr. Yamada today for putting on these very helpful and important uh, lectures this this morning, this afternoon, this evening. And um, and and just talking about how important the plastic and reconstructive surgery is uh, to our community, and and with that, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, I think it's it's important, particularly to educate the pediatricians. They're the they're the the life source for our division because that's from where our patients come, and to educate them on the fact that plastic surgery in children is very different from the 
cosmetic surgery and other types of things you see advertised. We don't advertise heavily. We go directly to the providers, and that's what the purpose of these talks is. Right. Yes, and you're really changing the lives of these children. It, it's just so apparent from, um, from these talks that you've done today. You do beautiful work. Well, thank you so much. And it's really our passion. And it, we, so if there's anything we can do that fall in the realm of the expertise we mentioned, we'd very much like to work with you. Well, and if you want to work with Dr. Gosain, um, you or the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Department, uh, they can be reached at 312-227-6250 or send them an email at plasticsurgery at lurychildrens.org. And if you're able to use Rapid Connect or Epic Staff Message, they can do it that way too. And just to remind you, Lurie MD is also uh, an option for you. But with that, I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight. And once again, thank you, Dr. Gosain. You, everyone have a great evening. Great. Well, thank you all for being here.